Okay. So this is this is Dwayne's. This is my sample kit right here with a pin. This has been bouncing around the back of my pickup for five years. And unbeknownst to you guys, I sample a lot of silage all over. Every place I stop, I usually sample silage. And a lot of guys are, I think some of the problem it is, most guys don't really know how to do it. And, and I'm not saying my way is the correct way, but I'm going to show you a simple way to do it. Um, the irony is this, this is the Pioneer Cup that I got from Dan Lewis many years ago. And uh, I still got it. And this got started by a guy in California. What's his name again? Lam John Lambert. He always wanted us. The, the, the problem with sampling when you're going to sample corn silage is the typical thing is guy always grabs a handful and looks. Oh, there's no kernels in there. Okay. It's a pretty unscientific sample. So he came up with, he, t he was always a big pop drinker, always drank these liters of pop. So he cut the top off the pop bottle and that became his sample. So that's how Pioneer got started with this. Well, Kloss upped it because that cup is bigger yet. So Kloss says, well, if you can find two kernels, this one here says spread out silage and two or less half or whole kernels is ideal. Says it right on the cup. I think Kloss has actually got something similar, but their cup's a little bit bigger. So I'm going to show you these. Were, the guys told me they could figure this out. I'm going to show you how I typically would do a sample. I've never done samples with fermented silage before. So this is going to be new. Um, we have a shredledge sample here out of a 492 on a guy that's using standard cut, but he has a shredledge processor. So is your camera high enough or it's not working? Okay. So this is important because you're usually on the tailgate of your truck. But you have to have a way to pick it back up if you're going to keep the sample to show the guy. So I just take a piece of this file folder. I pour the sample out a little bit at a time. Can, am I too, can you watch that there? There you go. Does that work? And then I just start sliding the stuff to the side. You slide it all to the side. Now this doesn't look like a very big cup. And you're looking for anything. And then what I usually do is I pick out pieces while I'm doing it, like that, so I can tell the guy how long he's cutting it. You're, you're always looking for stuff. So you're looking for some perfect cut leaves. So you can see, now this guy, I know where this sample came from. We took it out of his bunker. And I thought it was going to be a little bit too wet. The funny thing is, is when I first started doing that, if we saw a kernel that was even cut, we considered it was, uh, it was nicked enough. Now this guy, interesting thing is, is he bought a shredledge processor, but he didn't want to lengthen his length of cut. He said, Dwayne, I just want a better processor. So, if you're going to be really critical, you could say there's, we used to never even count those. We, con we considered them good. His length of cut's going to be about 17. Now, if I had the cloth cup here, you can quickly pull the gauge out and put it on here. And right there, you're about, he's about 18. And there's your sample. So I take these two kernels. I say, well, could have had it a little bit tighter. This is my garbage bag. Take this apart. When you got double vision, stuff's always very interesting. You see two of everything. And this is how I get it back in the bag without losing too much of the sample. I usually have a Sharpie on it. Try to squeeze the air out of it. 
Now this is, this is the Dwayne Skelton shaker box test. Bang it a few times and then quickly flip it over. And you're looking for fines. It's amazing the Shredlidge processor will always have more fines on the back side. Now, so that's one. Two kernels, I usually tape these two kernels at the top of the bag. If the guy wants to come in and see a sample, that's a sample. Not a bad job, pretty good job. We're going we're to do a shaker box test on that as well, but I'll, I'll do another sample first. Maybe while them guys are doing a shaker box test, I can show you another sample out of a, a different cutter. Um, where did the cup go that I had? Oh, that's... Well, well, we'll put them to a higher test and use a cloth sample. Okay. So... Uh, Here's a standard processor. And again, these are just random samples out of the... This is a Kloss with a standard processor. The first thing you're going to notice, which I can see already, he's a little longer length of cut. You hope the wind isn't blowing too hard that day you're doing this. The, 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 this is the first time I ever did a fermented sample. It is a little different. The kernels are a lot easier to spot on a fresh sample. And the irony is, is now the samples are getting critiqued because we will find small kernels. And the small kernels are really hard to get. I know this guy pretty well. I have never been out there where he's had a bad sample. But he does his own feed, doesn't do anything for anybody else, and he doesn't worry about how long it takes him to get done. He's always worried about how good a job he does. And he said, Dave, did you check me today? Yep, you're fine, doing just fine. So here's a length of cut piece. There's a length of cut piece. No, I'm going to have to switch glass because I can't do it anymore. There, that's better. Okay. There, these are nice samples for your length of cut. We're not even done yet. I got, boy, this, this bottle's big. Got a few little pieces here. They are half cut, but the new standard is obliteration. You can definitely tell this cup is bigger. There's a lot more stuff. I'm going to go back to the Pioneer Cup because this is going to take too long. Now you can tell how much higher the standard is that Kloss has done with a bigger cup. So we probably got. I'm going to call that a four. Again, grab another bag. So this is my uh, packet in the pickup kit. And you guys should be doing this once a day. And I'm serious. The guys in California, they're doing it more than once a day. They do it every field. I made a mess. Okay. Okay, now we got one more sample I want to do before we do the shaker box test. I'll clean that up later. Did you find my Pioneer Cup? Oh, good. Okay. Now, this is going to be more interesting because this is a sample that is done with, a shred with shredlage. And, oh yeah, I didn't bang this up and down. The big pieces kind of always come to the top when you do this. So in a way, it's a pretty effective shaker box test if you want to see what you're doing. There's some nice big pieces in here. That's, that's, that's what you're going to use for your hay. That's what you're going to use to get rid of your um, 
And there again, he's actually doing a really good job processing because there's a lot of fines in there. That's a good thing. You want to see those fines. Ten years ago, nobody cared about that. Dan mentioned to me, he noticed when he brought silage to somebody, when he, when he brings a t sample out, that the fines now, after doing his shredlage, he sees fines in the bottom of his pickup bed because they sort right out. And then fines help your, your cow's intake. It's a big deal. Okay, so this is, this is shredlage with half knives on a 492. Now the first thing you notice is definitely a longer length of cut. And when a person says he's doing shredlage, the first thing you've got to say, well, what length of cut? Technically, it isn't shredlage until it's over an inch long. And so, and you can probably already see here from the camera, there's a lot of fines in here. And that's the big challenge. The big challenge with shredlage, okay, what the nutritionists want, typically, especially if you're going to pull hay out of your ration, they want length, they want it to look like hay, and then they want it chopped really fine. Now that's a tough deal. How do you get it, cut it long and then get it chopped really fine and even have a hope of getting it through the processor? Because most processors are going to struggle. Whenever you're over three quarter of an inch long, you're going to have trouble with your processor unless your processor is designed to take this stuff that's over an inch long. So this is a 492 with half knives and admittedly they've always been our best samples. Um, when we get into talking a little bit about performance of choppers, I'm going to tell you some stories from California about guys that have made their 494s into 492s so they could put half knives in them. And when I drove out there during Tulare Farm Show, I thought to myself, they put 494 drums in their 492s. That's kind of cool. Well, I called them Monday night, and I said, Hey, Larry, from Netto Egg. I says, I didn't even know that worked. I didn't know we could put the 494 stuff in a 492. Yeah, doing it works okay. But he says, I needed the 492 drums. I go, what? Well, yeah, I put the 492 drums in my 980s so I could run half knives and do shredlage. I set up three of them. I go, wait a minute, wait a minute. So you put 492 drums in your 494 so you could put half knives in. Yeah, because it's a way better sample. Longer length of cut, and that's what we're doing. I'm going, wow. So the only reason this 492's had 494 drums in is because he had stolen the 494 drums out of the 492's. Pretty smart, I didn't even think of that. Yeah, there's only a couple wee little kernels in here. The interesting part of this test will be, I need my cloth cup because cloth's got the measuring thing on it. We're going to be, well, way over that gauge, so we're going to be about 31. So that's like an inch and... What's 31 mm? You guys? Inch and a quarter. Pretty consistent all the way through here. Now, I'll guarantee you on the shaker box test, this thing's going to score really, really high. And the other samples are going to struggle because they can't keep enough stuff in the top box to replace the hay. So it's, it's, a, it's a little bit more than shredlage. It's what you're trying to accomplish. And when you see the fines come up in this sample, that's pretty hard to duplicate. Okay, it's being difficult here. Oh, there we go. There we go. Somehow this always works better when nobody's watching you. There we go. So there was only probably two kernels in that sample. Again, look at the big pieces that... So this is a poor man's shaker box test. Look how quickly the big pieces float up. I discovered this by accident. I left a couple samples laying in the back of my pickup and driving through a cornfield that was quite rough. I got out and go, oh, that's kind of cool. 
Look at all those fines. It's an amazing difference. Totally amazing. This, this shaker box test, if we could send it in and have it uh, uh, kernel process scored, it, I'm going to guess it's going to be in the high 80s or 90s. And the other ones are going to be where most of the other ones are, it's like 50, 60. So that in a nutshell is how I do my samples. This sample will be a higher test. I might have to get a bigger piece of cardboard to keep it all on there. So I would encourage you guys to use this religiously. Keep this in your chopper. This is why we, you know, we went to expert camp this year in Texas and everybody's embracing this. I know a lot of you guys don't like it. That's fine. I totally understand. But everybody's embracing this. Kloss has spent some considerable time developing their processor so they don't have to listen how much better the shear processor is. And they've done a good job. They were at expert camp and it was all about cutting over an inch long. We're going to have to be a little bit careful how we use the word shredlage because it's a patented word. And I'm going to t right now, if you don't hear Shear talk about it anymore, it's because they don't want to pay royalty rights anymore on the shredlage. Okay? Long and simple. So they are they have broke away from the name. So now it's going to be called, if you notice in my newsletter, I purposely called it inch long or longer cut silage. That's really what shredlage is. It's, it's got to be cut longer than an inch to qualify. Everybody down south is doing it too. So anyway... In Texas, they purposely cut all their stuff. And admittedly, the Kloss processor did really well. I know Shear's here today. They don't like to hear that. But the Kloss processor did really well cutting the length of cut. Now, at the end of the day, the big issue is, is it going to live? We know the Shear processor lives. It's, it's got a shorter life. You will have a shorter life. You're going to get a better product. You're going to have a shorter life. It's not going to last as long. Shears made, they don't have any of the new ones here, but they've made improvements to their processors too with bigger shafts, um, different design in the rolls. They keep changing. Kloss is changing as well. Um, so everybody's scrambling. To tell you just a little side story, so I jumped Jared Fergoso a couple days ago. We've been back and forth on the phone. I was hoping to get him come here. He's got four customers now that there's all shredlage. I said to him, I says, well, has anybody else approached you? Yeah, he says, uh, Crohn's been wanting me to try out their chopper because they claim they got it done. And all I do is tell them to go to the pit, get a sample, and if they can duplicate that sample, they can come here and chop. I said, they can't duplicate that sample, leave. Well, he's doing it with half knives, so it'd be like the last sample here. That's how he does it all. His scores are in the low 90s, and he checks them. But, admittedly, he runs the processor really tight. He's the guy, if you don't remember, some of you new guys, back in the day, he's, his setting on the processor is similar to Dale Hillbaugh's with a paint. He says, we, we turn them down, we zing them. I go, zing them? Yeah, we just, till they touch, and then we just back them up just a little bit, and that's where we leave them set. That's the way our farmers like it. Well, that's why he's getting high processing scores. So I realize a lot of you guys don't have the patience for that because it takes a lot of horsepower at that point in time. And, uh, but it's the guys that are doing it and getting these kind of results and pulling all the hay out of their rations, that's what they're doing. But it costs money. And we're going to talk a little bit about that too. It costs money. So I, I want to do at least two shaker box tests so you guys can see that. So I'm going to ask Forrest and them guys. Forrest, Forrest is the, the real shaker. He doesn't look like he's a really big shaker, but he, 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 he says he's got this down. So, <laughs> so I'm going to ask him to shake box test the shredlage with half knives. While he's doing that, I'm going to do one more sample of a, of a John Deere, a, a, an early model John Deere in the county that we took a sample from with his permission. And he 
told me I couldn't tell anybody where it was from. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, Dan brought me a sample too, but we're probably not going to take the time to do that. I already know Dan checks his stuff pretty well. He's the guy who gave me the cup, so I know he, uh, he knows what this is all about. Yeah, this is the right one. Now this shaker box test is fascinating because... You having trouble? No, go ahead. Just get started. Because I know you're kind of slow. It takes me a little time to do this too, but oh well, yeah, you can just watch him. I'll do this John Deere one. So he's going to get a, they ask for about six pints. And the kernel processing score is done somewhat similar. Um, well, you wrecked my display. Always got to be in the, in the limelight, don't you? Now they do this on TMRs too. But the TMR ends up being differently because if, you have, if you're adding hay to your TMR, then the sample's going to be a little different. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to fit that in there. But well, you can pour them out. Just pour them out on here. Well, We're only going to do two. Oh, you're going to weigh them? Oh, wow, you're getting really scientific. Okay. That's good. That's good. Notice all the big pieces. Now this is the shredlage with half knives. This is really, you're asking the processor to do more than your knives are doing when you're doing this. It, it, if somebody would have said 20 years ago that you could actually get this stuff through a chopper, they'd have laughed at you. Because most of you know what it's like if you plug up a processor. The first thing that happens, what happens when a guy plugs a processor? He shortens the length of cut because he doesn't want to unplug it again. And it's a bear cat. So to see guys go through the whole season, because this was done at the tail end of the season, and this is the second year on this machine too, by the way, so um, that did this sample here. Second year in the same processor, The fascinating thing, so you're doing shaker box tests and you've got four drawers with all different size sieves. The interesting thing is, is the expectation is you've got to get a lot in the top and a lot in the bottom. That's expecting a lot. So naturally, if you cut it too short, which the John Deere sample will show, because it's probably cut at 17, if it's cut too short, there's hardly nothing left in the top. And what, what the argument is, but the nutritionists are always telling you, if you're going to replace hay in the ration, you've got to have a lot of stuff on, on the long length of cut that the cows can chew and chew their cud. Because if you don't have anything up there, they eat it all too fast, and then that isn't good either. So it's a fascinating dilemma. Trying to be so delicate. That doesn't fit you. Doesn't fit you very well being delicate. I'm <laughs> bigger hammer. So, what we're using for instructions on? I guess I can. All right. Uh, what we're using for instructions on this are the. Uh, Instructions right off the Penn State uh, EDU extension website. So the people who actually developed this shaker box. So we're using their original instructions. And the goal is, is you go around twice, 360 degrees twice, shaking five times at every quarter turn. And uh, the rate of shake they want is one shake per second with a seven inch movement. 
I, I, I watched you. You were pretty close. We're, we're, yeah, we're yeah, pretty yeah, close. yeah, yeah, you were really close. It, I, ironically, uh, I was a little worried right, for the shaker box, like it might get destroyed or something. Yeah, you're pretty it, close. It says right on the screen here, it says make sure you calibrate your shaking distance. <laughs> no, I well, don't know. Well, when you wrecked my banner, I knew it was already over. All right. Uh, so what you're looking for in your, in your upper sieve or sieve is uh, it's a 0.75 inch sieve and you want approximately... Uh, oh. Be careful though because the Penn State stuff is based on TMR. It doesn't necessarily apply to corn silage. So ironically, I talked to a guy at Vita Plus this morning. He said, Dwayne, if you do get a lot more in the top one and the bottom one, that's even better. But understand that most of the original Penn State was done around a TMR ration not necessarily around the corn silage ration. Okay. So. All right. Well, what they had asked for is 5% of weight in the top one. The next one, which is a 0.31 inch hole, that one they wanted 40% weight in. The next one, which is a 0.16 inch hole, they wanted 20% weight in. And then they wanted... 35% remaining at the bottom of the fine chaff. All right, so Mike, you want to come do some math here? Oh, funny, <laughs> funny. I didn't know if you guys caught yesterday, but Forrest made a little bit of a mistake on his diesel fuel savings, and young lad here quickly ran up to me and said, hey, that, his math's wrong, so it's been an inside joke. So now we're going to let the math guy figure this out. So another, another part of the joke was uh, Forrest is a Patriot fan, and I was at his house after they, they won, and I was like, I was glad NBC showed that the Patriots won because Forrest had trouble calculating if they actually won with a score. <laughs> All right. so. Hold on, what's our time? Well, you guys are really getting... Oh. And, and, and the 5% the on top? So we have 173 grams here. Which one's that? You got the Sharpie? Okay. I did have. My Sharpie's right here. Right, we, got, we got something, Okay. So, this is going to be top 173. Number two is going to be 193. Number three is going to be 91. And then 74 in the bottom. And a more scientific shaker. So if we let you shake the next one, then we'll we'll have a fair comparison. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So for those of you who never heard of the word TMR, it's total mixed ration. So, but it changes everything. So it, the shaker box tests, as a guy from Vita Plus told me yesterday, he said, Dwayne, remember that everything in in Penn State is based on TMR, which is total mixed ration. So corn silage is just one component of that. So he said if you can get, the more you can get in the top box, the better. That is always the goal when we want to pull hay out of the ration. So I'm going to, you guys can start. I'm going to, this is the John Deere, and I'll do the, 
the other thing is, 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 is that they explained to me was the fact that um, with starch, as many of you well know, that, that ironically the tests go up and the kernel processing score goes up once it's fermented, which I did not know before. But, so the kernel processing score will actually increase. Now, Mark, did you put up... Uh, anyway, when you get a kernel processing score, they use a fancy machine that costs about 4000 bucks. And that machine, actually, you, have to, you have to dry your samples before and after and take a starch analysis. It costs about $40 to get a kernel processing score. They do that in Wisconsin. And almost every dairy in California that has custom harvesters gets their kernel processing score checked monthly. Can you imagine being underneath that kind of scrutiny? Monthly, they're sending samples in for 40 bucks, but the nutritionists, you're talking about 10,000 cow dairies. So that's the kind of scrutiny they're under for their kernel processing score. But the kernel processing score is a lot more scientific than this. So this is, judging by the sample that they're doing now, this John Deere is probably at a 15 length of cut. And I assume he probably could have cut it a little bit longer, but was probably struggling to get it through a kernel processor. Number one, he will get quite a bit of stuff in the bottom box because he's cut it so short. And that's one benefit of cutting it short, but I think as you guys can see already in the first drawer, there wasn't much in the top box at all. And that is the problem. So when, even if, like the cloth sample we did earlier, that was done with a shredlage processor, but he didn't lengthen the length of cut. He did a lot better job processing, there's no doubt about that, but he didn't gain any long cut pieces, so he can't really cut out any hay out of his ration. And the other thing is that everybody on a shaker box test will tell you that if there's kernels making it through there, they want you to subtract the kernels back out because they, didn't, they won't make it all the way down to the bottom and that affects your starch test. And you guys got handouts laying there of, of some tests that were done. We went over them last year, but I think the thing to notice on the handouts is how cheap corn silage is. I think even with the cost of shredlage, it's like 3.1 or 3.2 cents a pound. It's by far your cheapest ingredient in your ration. So it even validates how much more important it is to get it done right. I think that's out of the field. Good question. Every year I get popped questions I wasn't prepared for, so... How are you guys doing there? Are you ready to go with the next one? Yeah, we got it. So I assume you're going to see some kernels in the second box, right? Yeah. Yeah, yep. yeah because I got over 20 kernels up here and I still got a sample left to do. So this dairyman, ironically, is not getting full utilization of his corn. And he probably grabbed a handful and looked at it, not so bad. But if, if the camera could come back up here, you would see how many kernels I already found. And it isn't that hard. I'm not even, I'm not even sorting them all out. It's actually somewhat embarrassing. And I was down in Skagit County this year. Followed a brand new John Deere chopper around in Skagit County, and the sample is worse than that. And, the, and he says, Dwayne, really? And then he stopped, cranked it down, and I said, you still got 10 kernels in the sample. You're kidding. I go, yeah. But I says, I'm getting out of here because I can sense you're already mad. 
And it, it was, you know, so this is all about, you're, you're trying to do your customer a favor. You're putting this feed in their bunk. You need to do these samples so that they know what they're getting. So very critical stuff. So what would you come up with there? Uh, we got 47 in the bottom. We got 55 in number 3, 471 in number 2, and 30 in the top. So even though we got a more combined weight considerably, you had less in the bottom. Okay. A lot of kernels. A lot of kernels, and they actually want you to pull those kernels out because they... And I don't understand all that. I'm not a nutritionist, but it's fascinating talking to these guys. This starch thing is a big deal. Any questions? So next year, feel free to call me. I'll come out and do a sample for you. I mean, um, it's pretty easy to do, but you saw how I do it, did it. You can do it yourself with a cup. The handful thing does not work. Literally does not work. You have to have a constant... Um, so there's handouts on your thing. They're the same handouts we handed out last year. And I corrected the error on the one that we handed out last year because uh, a person brought up that it was not priced properly because the corn silage should be priced differently because there was extra cost. And he was correct. Because the corn silage on the first sample that we handed out last year was all priced the same. I think it was all priced at $60 a ton, right? So, um, so I thought, you know, let's correct that. Let's say corn silage costs another $2 a ton to harvest as shredlage. And BMR corn, I picked $10 and I added $10 to that. And as you can see on the second sheet, it changed it some, but not a whole lot. Um, one thing to notice, I was looking for a pointer. Uh, grab my, somebody grab my stick over there off the corn head. Oh, yeah, that, does that work? I don't know if it shows up that well. You got to pull the button now. Oh, that's a pain. Yeah. Technology. Ah, just give me my stick. Did you find it? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, it would work pretty well. Okay. Uh, it's always interesting taking your family into your business. They they have less respect for you than your employees do. That's always the case, as you fathers well know that. Okay. All right. So this is corrected. Um, as you can see, the striking thing about this is the low price of corn silage. When you look at all these costs, three cents without doing anything to it, two dollars a ton adds, you know, a point tenth of a cent, then a half a cent on BMR. That's kind of fascinating. I wanted to make sure you understood that. You know, you get to the grains and suddenly you're 17 cents a pound or 10 cents a pound for rolled corn. It dramatically ratchets up. So your corn silage is definitely your cheapest thing. I'm assuming, I don't know. Good question, I forgot to ask. Maybe somebody here that recognizes these numbers can tell me if they're dry matter or not, but they're not. Okay. Okay. So it's wet. Oh, it says on the bottom. Okay. All right. Total as fed pounds. So sorry about that. I should have caught that. It is wet. Okay. But the interesting thing is, so we still have 23 cents here. Now, if you've got your pens and paper... So it's 23.42. I did all the math. I did the math 15 times to make sure I had it right. So it's 23.42 cents. Now, this came off a 2,000 cow dairy at Malkin Jerseys. Okay? The guy who does his chopping for him, which is Jared Fergoso, 
He has his own dairy. He milks 500 cows. They're all Jerseys. Jared, I asked Jared, I said, Jared, you didn't like this the first year. You hated this shredded stuff. He said, Dwayne, I still do. It's a lot of work. And I go, well, did you leave a couple choppers set up for it? Nope. I go, you're kidding me. Plus, he said, we got three new customers, and they're all Shredledge as well. And they're, nobody's going back, and now we have trouble finding, Jed told me, we have trouble finding control herds because nobody wants to test the standard stuff. Okay? So, but when you factor this in, and Jared says, yeah, and I'm doing it for my own, but I'm not telling any of my customers, because I still hate this stuff, but it's a lot of work, but I'm doing all my own. I switch a cutter back and forth to do my own. I asked him, I said, so, he said, Dwayne, I'm, I'm saving $30,000. And if I figure $10,000 for cost, it's still 20 grand a year on not buying filler and no hay. So he figured $10,000 would cost him to do his shredlage, and he was still saving 20 by not buying any filler and no hay. But if you calculate these numbers out on a 500 cow dairy, you got your pen and paper there, on a 500 cow dairy, you're $117 a day you're saving for 500 cows. A month, 3,500 bucks a month. That's on a 500 cow dairy. And both Jared and Diaz told me they're up more than six pounds in milk. And that's not factored in. The six pounds in milk calculates out to $14,400 a month at $16. Remember, pretty the big numbers. You cannot not say there's a definite effect of shredlage. So, I'll give you Jared's phone number. I'll give you Diaz's phone number. You're welcome to call him. Um, and, and Jared, you know, he's a kind of a, he's a really soft, quiet-spoken guy. He doesn't like to talk a whole lot, but, you know, Here's the fascinating thing. So when you work these numbers backwards, let's say you, don't, you want to put a value on shredlage. So this was the only number you didn't know. Okay? And it's 75 cents. So you want to put a value on shredlage. Let's, let's put it back in this standard diet right here, this conventional diet. But it's an unknown. So if you factor that all backwards, what's this shredlage worth? If you take out these other pieces, it is worth 98.9 .9 cents a pound. So if you, you, if you put this in as an unknown, factor it back, what it's saving you in hay and, and, and some uh, boot wheat, 98.9 .9 cents, that shredlage now just became worth $80 a ton. Okay, I'm kind of a numbers guy. I like numbers, but anyway, it's always fascinating when they make your eyes open up really wide and you go, wow, that's a lot of money. Okay, so the interesting fact about talking to Jared, so I just assumed he was leaving. He, they got a dozen 900s. I just assumed he was leaving one or two of them set up. And he goes, no, we switch back and forth. I go, you've got to be kidding me. Well, we can only get 80 acres ready at a time. They watch their moisture like a... They watch moisture. Because the starch deal. You get 5% more starch for every 5 pounds lighter in moisture you are. So if it isn't at 65, they won't cut. If it's above 65%, they moved to a different field. So he said, most of my customers only got 80 acres ready at a time. We move in, chop the 80 acres, we take the chopper back home, we take all the half knives back out, take the processor back out, and we go back to conventional. I said, how many times did you do that? 12 times last year. Now it has to be worth something for a guy to do that. I don't know how you argue against that. He did it 12 times, switched them back and forth, and he said, we're going to do the same thing this year because I can't afford to have a cutter set in there that we're not using. So I talked to Neto, 
I was really fascinated by him because I already talked a little bit about that because when I drove through his lot at Tulare, I, I, was, I was taken back. He wasn't around. Nettles run about close to 20 cloth choppers. They got about, and maybe James knows better than I do. I, I, I think they have like a dozen 980s and then the rest of them are all 900s. Is James still here? Yeah, he's oh, okay. Anyway, I drove through their lot. They're right along the road. I drive around the front. I drive past these 900s, and I recognize they got 494 drums in them. I never knew you could do that. And I'm going, wow. And then his competitor says, yeah, he's, he's, he's doing that. He claims it works pretty good. So I just thought, I came back and told my guys. I said, hey, we can put 494 drums in 492s, make it easier to change the knives. Well, the funny thing is, I, so I called him up to see how well that was working. And he says to me, he says, uh, that works okay. But he says, it's working a lot better than the 494s. I go, what do you mean? Well, I have to do shredlage. I couldn't get the length of cut and shredlage, so I put the 492 drums in my 494s so that I swapped them. And then I ran half knives to get the exact thing we had in that top shaker box with that long length of cut and shredlage. So he, he went full circle, because on the 494s, we cannot get them to cut as long as we can on the 492 with half knives. So now, you asked earlier about switching your pulley. That may be a better option, but unfortunately, it's a lot of work. So he's doing the same thing. He switches the knives out, but that's his way to get his long length of cut, because he said, my guys are asking for 28 length of cut. And so he's run 492 drum in his 980s, and he's run them with half knives to do shredlage. I was totally blown away, because on our 494s originally, we can only get out to 22, and that's not quite long enough to get that top shaker box full, or where you want it so you can take your hay out. They, they really want you to be at 26, 27. Okay, um, any more questions about shredlage? Clear as mud? Good. Okay, Who want, anybody want to talk about costs? What do you think it costs you to run your machine? I don't know what we talked about last year. I couldn't find my notes last year. We talked about this, what it costs to own a machine. I will... <clears throat> I know a guy, ironically, when we talk about rates and costs, I don't know if you guys remember, but last year we talked about Scott Johnson. Um, he was one of the cheapest ones I found. He's in Texas. He runs, uh, I think, six 970s, most of them with 12-row heads. And if you remember, he was the guy that was charging $5.50 for the chopper. It's kind of reasonable, especially compared to all the other guys we talked to a ton. I was struck by how reasonable that was because last year everybody else was around $10 put in the bunk. So he was about eight bucks put in the bunk per ton, stacked. Nice guy. He made the Kloss video. The fact is, we might have a video up here where he's on there, because he trades every 1,900 hours. He trades cutters. I called him to get an update from him, and he's quitting. He wasn't charging enough money. He said, Dwayne, I'm done. I talked to his dealer. Yeah, it was kind of shocking because he's, he's been on the Kloss video. He's been kind of a poster child for Kloss. So he was at 5.50 a ton. I says, so I, I, I talked to Scott and I says, uh, were you not charging enough? Yeah, we we're just spinning our wheels. I got tired of it, not making any money. I got trucks, so we're just going to do it with trucks, get rid of all the cutters. So I thought, now here's a perfect example of what it costs of ownership. 
He's run them for nine. He's actually got 2,000 some cutter hours on all of them, 2,400 now on most of them. He's going to be tickled to get 200 grand for them because he's got to sell them on the open market. And they all need work. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I know, I know. I, I'm aware. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware. So, I crunch the numbers. It's going to cost him $350,000 a unit for them hours. That, and, and they still need to be fixed. They need to be gone through. So you add that. You add what it cost him for interest for three years to own them. And suddenly you're at 170, 175 bucks an hour. It's getting more expensive. And with tier four coming on, now, you're not going to have the same cost on a smaller machine. I'm aware of that. Ironically, he's going to have a harder time selling those machines than I would sell in a 940. But the cost is still, it's, it's going to be 150 bucks plus. If you're looking for a number on cost of ownership, I talked to John Schaendorf. He runs 11 of them. 970s with 10 rows and 12 rows. Now he trades every 1,800 hours. And of course, he never likes to tell me what he, get, what he cost him to trade. I said, are you, are you paying 150 bucks an hour? Ah, oh, Dwayne, I'm getting them for a little better than that. Really? Well, yeah, but I don't always trade heads. So then I guess you've got to factor that in. It's, yeah. And you don't have a choice. When John Schaendorf shows up, he's at 12 bucks a ton packed in the bunk and no options all shredlage so and he says we get our processing scores done weekly there we send them in get them checked he's the guy that told me where to send the processing scores in I think for you custom guys that's a service you got to start offering if you want to have loyal customers you prove to them you're doing a good job you will have loyal customers when you can prove to them you're doing a good job but that's about all I had as far as cost of ownership, unless you, had, you wanted some more information, but some of it's pretty repetitive. Any other questions? Comments? All right. <laughs>